everybody, and now we're going to talk about how technology, research, and development and efficiency interact in an economic sense. We're going to look at invention, innovation, and diffusion, and technological innovation is something that we see all of the time. What's the role of an entrepreneur and other innovators? A firm's optimal amount of research and development, how firms can increase profits with innovation, imitation and R&D incentives, the role of market structure and technological advance and efficiency. So te technological advance is any time we are able to make new or better goods or services or produce them in a new or better way or distribute them in a new or better way. So we can invent a new product or we can come up with a way to make a product cheaper or we could distribute it more efficiently. Those are all forms of technological advance. Generally, it occurs over the very long run, but it can be short. It can be short as a few months or as long as many years. It, it all depends on what's being invented and who's doing the inventing. But technological advance consists of a three-step process of invention, innovation, and diffusion, and shifts a country's production possibilities curve outwards. The good thing about technological advance is it allows us to make more goods and services, better goods and services. So in the very long run, and that's what we're going to look at here. In the very short run, we would say there's really no change in technology, plant, or equipment. That's a matter of weeks, a month, something like that. In the long run, plant and equipment can change, but technology usually doesn't, whereas in the very long run, technology changes with research and development. And research and development is something that all sorts of companies invest heavily in uh, to grow and uh, improve themselves. So an invention is any time we make a new product or process. So when Apple came up with the iPhone, that was an invention. It was a new product. It's based on scientific knowledge, and inventions are generally patented. They're legally protected. I can't make a cell phone that looks like an iPhone and call it an iPhone if I'm not Apple, if I'm some other company. So Apple has patented the iPhone and trademarked um, all of its various devices as well. The difference between invention and innovation is the following. An innovation is any time we do something which cannot be patented. Innovation follows invention. It's the commercial introduction of a new product or process. So if someone invents a new product and then we commercialize it, that's a product innovation. If someone comes up with a new way to mine lithium for batteries much cheaper than ever before, that's a process innovation. But generally, we cannot patent innovation. Whereas an actual invention, we're the first person to invent a 6G cell phone, for instance, that would be an invention. We could patent that. So I misspoke a bit. The smartphone was an invention, whereas the specific iPhone, that's an innovation. Innovations you can protect with trademarks. So you can't make a phone and call it the iPhone because Apple has trademarked it but you can't patent something that's already been invented. You can just commercialize it, improve it, and those are all innovations. So what is diffusion? Diffusion is the spread of new innovation through imitation or copying back to smartphones. Originally, the iPhone comes out. There were a few handful of Android phones, Blackberries, and within a few years, there were hundreds of different models of smartphones across every possible price point from high-end to cheap devices on Amazon. That's an example of diffusion. So once a product catches on, then companies are going to um, copy the products. So uh, Tesla came out with uh, electric cars that were long range and well and uh, well optioned and now pretty much every automaker has started introducing upper range electric models. So that's another example once again of diffusion. So um, firms come out with new innovations and this is crucial to capitalism and a healthy economy. Diffusion uh, allows not one company to make a product. Now we have tremendous choices on cell phones, not just an iPhone. And for diffusion to work, companies have to spend heavily on research and development. Uh, in 2015, almost half a trillion dollars, $469 billion, was spent by businesses and, and government in the United States just simply on research and development. So a tremendous amount of money, time is poured into R&D all of the time. And here's an example of 
of R&D expenditures as a percentage of GDP. United States a little over 3%, Israel almost 5%, South Korea close to that as well, and that's just going down the list. So research and development is very important because it allows technological change, new products, better products, more efficient ways of doing things. Without R&D, which is considered a capital good, we would never actually uh, grow or change or, or get new products. And um, here we go. So in 2019, basic research about 7% of R&D, new inventions about 15%. So basic research is setting groundwork, generic research, applied research is we want to invent a 6G cell phone, let's say, or we want to invent the next generation of computer processor. That's applied research. And then development, innovation, and imitation, so improving the products we have. When Apple comes out with the iPhone 15 in September, that's an example of development. They already have the product. They're just improving it. It's an innovation. Uh, and if uh, one of our competitors invents something that we deem is a good product and we want to make our own, so we're Mercedes and we saw Tesla coming out with all of these luxurious electric cars and now we invented our own, that would be an example of imitation. So what's the driving force of technological advance? Well, capitalism. Uh, technological advance leads to profits, to growth. We're not going to just invent new products because we want to. We're inventing new products because we hope they're successful and they're going to make us money. So profit is always our incentive for technological advance. And the cause is rivalry among firms. Our competition is going to come up with new technologies, so we better as well, or improve the ones we have, or we're going to get passed by the wayside. So it starts within the economy, it's internal to capitalism, and um, this is a very important thing. So most contemporary economists see technological advances from within the economy, not from outside of it like the old view was or from randomness. It is uh, advances in scientific knowledge. They're motivated by being able to commercially develop those advances and expected profits. That's why we do this. So what are the role of entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs are, once again, we talked about this at the very beginning of the class, entrepreneurs are initiators, innovative, innovators, and risk bearers. They're different than regular employees because to be an entrepreneur, you have to be very comfortable with taking risk. There's a high chance that whatever you uh, bring to market or whatever business you, you create is going to fail and you might lose a lot of money or time or all of the above. So being able to bear that risk is what makes entrepreneurs so special. And generally when an entrepreneur starts a company, it's called a startup. Now, what about some other innovators? Innovators who don't bear financial risk, so unlike an entrepreneur, are called intrapreneurs. And they're key to the R&D process. So if you're a scientist who works for Microsoft or Apple, and you're developing a next generation of computers or phones or something like that, you'd be an intrapreneur. You're not gonna take any risk if your product you come up with is a failure. I mean, you're not going to be personally responsible for the money it loses. The worst you could do is lose your job, but you're not going to go bankrupt or something like that. However, there's less upside than being an entrepreneur. You're not going to be Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or someone who makes billions of dollars if you are successful. Entrepreneurs work in existing companies and generally they get pay incentives. So if you invent a very successful product, you'll get big bonuses. You can make a lot of money doing that. But once again, less upside than if you're the boss, if you're the entrepreneur, you would get the bulk of it. So big companies, the Apples, Microsofts, Googles, and Facebook all have entrepreneurs. Uh, universities and governments do as well. And um, that's very important because a lot of technological change has started in universities and, and government funded laboratories and things like that. So the op amount of R&D for a company, it would depend on the company, but as you may have suspected, we simply are going to compare marginal benefits and marginal costs. R&D isn't free, it costs us money to do it, so our cost is going to be the interest rate cost of our money. So even if we use our own money, the interest rate still matters because we could invest that money in something else and make a profit. So if we use our own funds, uh, that is still a consideration and obviously if we borrow money via loans or bonds or something like that or from venture capitalists which are people who fund risky businesses and get a share of the profit if it succeeds or our own savings no matter where we get the money there is an interest rate cost of funds 
And the interest rate cost of funds is usually fixed, and that's what we're looking at here. No matter how much money we spend on the R&D, the interest rate is generally going to be the same, uh, whatever our cost of capital is. If you take an accounting class, you'll go further into what determines a company's cost of capital. Here we're just simplifying it, but in this case, we're saying this company's interest rate is 8%. So no matter what amount of money they borrow, it's going to be 8%. So the firm can finance as much or as little R&D as you want. That's why the line is flat. They're going to pay an 8% cost on the money that they use. So now what do we do? We gotta compare what we would expect our investment to make us, our expected rate of return, and we're gonna compare that to our cost or our interest. And the expected rate of return curve slopes downward due to the diminishing returns for R&D expenditures. Uh, R&D expenditures, excuse me. Uh, as we increase R&D spending, the amount of return is going to drop more and more and more. It's diminishing returns. And the other thing you have to understand, these are expected and not guaranteed. There is no such thing as a guaranteed surefire success whenever you're doing R&D. There's always a chance whatever you do could fail. And that is uh, something very important as well. And sometimes we may need to make monetary adjustments. And we're gonna determine what our optimal amount of R&D is. And the spoiler is it's going to be when the cost and the benefit is equal. When if we spend more on R&D, we're going to get less benefits than it's going to cost us. Same as with products or anything like that. So our expected rate of return schedule is right here. And um, the more we spend, we're going to get less and less and less return because we're going to be spending more and more and more money. You can't just get never ending returns. The more you spend on R&D, eventually, once again, you will hit diminishing returns. And that's what we're looking at here. So what's the optimal amount of R&D? Well, generally, we're going to spend on R&D to when our rate of return is up to our cost. When that means an additional unit of R&D is going to cost more than it benefits us up to the point where the lines cross is going to be in our favor. So in this sense, our expected rate of return at 8% for R&D of 60 million, our interest rate uh, is 8%. That's what is our optimal amount of R&D. So where the lines cross, where the interest line and the rate of return line cross, that is going to be our optimal amount of R&D. So what about increased profit via innovation? Innovation's important because customers are going to demand improved products. You're not gonna buy the same cell phone every single year without a better camera or a better battery or anything like that. So innovation is demanded, product improvements are demanded by your customers, but they're not always successful. Think of all the new products that you can think of that uh, came to market that failed. Just because you come up with a new product does not mean it is going to work. Or if you change a product, Coca-Cola changed their formula in the 1980s and made something called New Coke. It was a spectacular failure. It led to protests and within a few months they reverted to their original formula. So uh, just because you improve or come up with a new product does not necessarily mean it's going to be successful. And also price is very important. If you bring a new product or an improved product to market, you have to price it in a way that makes it attractive to your consumers. Your new product may be very intriguing, but if it's so expensive that very few people can afford it, it's probably not going to be successful. And another thing that's very important, we can reduce our costs through innovation as well. We come up with better ways to make things, cheaper ways to make things, more efficient ways to make things, and the goal behind this is to reduce our costs and also increase our revenues. So if we look here with the introduction of a new product when income is equal to $10, what are we going to do? So to maximize the utility from spending $10 on innovations A and B, you buy the products in order of their marginal utility per dollar. So A is a dollar and B is two dollars. So if we have 10 total dollars, what would we do? So first buy one unit of product B. This is going to give us 12 units per dollar and we spent two bucks. Then buy one unit of A and B because we get 10 per dollar. Marginal utility per dollar is going to be there. Then buy one unit of product B, now we're in the third. This is going to give us nine per dollar here. 
we spent two, then by one unit of A and B, giving us eight per dollar, and we spent our last three. If product C is introduced with one of the choices, with a $4 price, you would buy one unit of C because now we're getting more utility per dollar for C than any of the others. And then you would buy one unit of B and C. And you would buy a total of the combination that maximizes your utility, one B, two C for a total of 124 utility. So once again, you don't have data like this in real life. You don't know exactly the amount of utility that something's gonna give you. Economics is very theoretical. But what you want to do is maximize your own utility. So buy products in the combination. That's the best utility or the best outcome for yourself. And that's what we're looking at here. Because remember, people have unlimited desires and limited wants, limited, excuse me, unlimited desires and limited income. So imitation and R&D incentives. So let's take a look here. So imitation of a firm's product is a way to enhance your profit. So if you see your competitor come out with something very successful, if Coke introduces some new kind of soda, you bet Pepsi within a year is going to make something very similar. And the best strategy is what's known as the fast second strategy in this case. So what that means is you allow a dominant firm, uh, a dominant firm is going to, going to allow smaller firms to innovate and then quickly imitate the smaller firm's successful innovations using its power and economies of scale to prevail. So being first oftentimes is very good, but there's nothing wrong with being second if you do it quick enough. So if we're a giant tech company and a small startup comes up with a new way to interface with a smartphone, let's say, and it's really promising, we're gonna then use all of our power to do the same with our own products as fast as we can with all of our financial might and our economies of scale behind us. That's a fast second strategy. You let someone else take the risk of doing the innovation and then use your power to get the market anyway. That only works if you're a lot larger than your competitor. If your competitor is just as large as you, they're gonna get what's known as a first mover advantage. And there is quite a few benefits to being first. And these are the following. Number one, if we invent something or come up with something, we can patent it or copyright it or trademark it. And we may actually be able to block our competitors from doing something similar or at least have to make them change the product enough that ours is very differentiated. Even if we can't necessarily do all of that, we get brand name recognition. If you're the first to market with something or the first to really commercialize it, think of things that have become ubiquitous with its brand name, like Ziploc bags. Ziploc is just one manufacturer of bags, but they did invent that style of bag a very long time ago. Or Saran Wrap. Saran Wrap's just a brand of plastic wrap, but once again, they were the first to bring it to market. So if you get that brand name recognition and people are going to automatically equate your product with your brand name, that is a huge advantage. Other things, you get trade secrets and learning by doing. So once again, if you're the first to do something, you know what works, what doesn't, how to make it best, and you develop trade secrets by doing it. Uh, time lags. If you're the first to market, even if your competitor has the resources to bring a similar product to market, so let's say we're Coke and Pepsi is gonna copy our new soda, we beat them to the market. They can't just snap their fingers and have a new soda come out a day later. It's going to take them time. And in that time, we're going to have the market. We're gonna get all of those benefits and make a good amount of money. And finally, things like buyouts. If we're a small company and we make a successful product, we may do it because we want Coca-Cola to buy us out or Apple to buy us out or Microsoft to buy us out and make a lot of money as a consequence. We might make a product that's so good, it's cheaper for a large company to snap us up than to try to compete with us. And US patents by foreign firms, these are just foreign countries that hold the most patents in the United States. And imitation and, imitation and R&D expenditures have been steadily increasing uh, from 1990 to 2015, and this is not something that will be abating anytime soon. This is a direct cause from technology and all the new technologies that have come out and, and progress, R&D spending keeps going up uh, throughout time. And this is a trend that has kept going. So one argument you can make on R&D is what is known as the inverted U theory. And the inverted U theory is firms R&D spending rises with industry concentration ratio. 
So the more concentrated an industry, uh, an industry gets, R&D is going to rise. It will hit a peak of 50% and then decline after this. And we have some evidence to support this. Here's an example. So as competition is decreasing, that's what we're looking at here, less firms in the industry, R&D is going to rise. It's going to peak at about 50% of sales right here and then start declining again as the industry gets less and less and less competitive. So it goes up, people leave the industry and then it starts declining again. And it generally peaks around 50% of sales, um, give or take. So as we trend towards something like an oligopoly, like we looked at a few chapters ago, then R&D is going to drop again. So competition is healthy for R&D, and as firms start leaving, generally R&D decreases. Technological advance and efficiency. Well, technology, why do we love technology? Technology leads to all sorts of efficiency. It gives us productive efficiency, meaning with better technologies, we can make things more efficient and cheaper. Think of tech products, computers were more expensive in 1980s money than in today's money, and that's all due to productive efficiency. Flat screen TVs when they came out 25 years ago were $10,000, $20,000, and now you can get a good one for a few hundred that is orders of magnitude more clear and has more features. These are all forms of productive efficiency. Technology also gives us allocative efficiency. It allows us to determine a better mix of goods and services to provide. We can poll our customers better. Um, we can make sure that what we are creating and selling is what uh, our customers want, and that is allocative efficiency. You can have productive efficiency without allocative efficiency. You could be the best maker of some sort of obsolete product, but it doesn't necessarily mean that anybody would want it. And uh, technology is important because it leads to new products, new processes, and Every single day, old products and old ways of doing things become obsolete through that notion of creative destruction. And if we look at our last slide here, we're going to talk about how patents have influenced medicine. So patents should provide inventors with a monopoly over their inventions, but it should be a temporary one. And it's become routine for drug companies to game the patent system in order to extend their monopolies and increase prices significantly. So what do they do? Um, they found ways to just slightly alter one of their products to keep patent protection around their innovations. And, what, and if you're a big enough pharmaceutical company, you have the ability to do this. And it removes much of the incentive to innovate with newer profits because the companies are still profiting heavily from older inventions. So they take some sort of prescription medication and they modify it enough they can continue patenting it, making a controlled release or a little better or altering a formula. And it allows them to keep patent protections over this product and keep manufacturing it and um, you could argue this impedes creative destruction and is why drug costs can be so high and um, why it takes so long sometimes for generic drugs to make it to market because when a drug company has a patent on a drug they're the only one who can make it unless they grant a license to someone else to do so and that's just something to think about as we conclude chapter 15 and that's going to take us to the very end the chapter.